Okay, we're running out of time, so um, let me emphasize the important parts of this chapter. This is uh, habit three, uh, putting first things first. We talked about last week the uh, leadership versus management. Leadership was habit two. Uh, begin with the end in mind. That's what that's you know what you're trying to achieve, and so you need to know what your end is. But now you have to turn it over to management. I, I mentioned the, uh, the the case study, I believe, uh, of the guy who was taking the workshop from Stephen Covey. He was running an oil company, and uh, he realized that he had been managing. He had not been leading. And so he had to remove himself from management, make other people do the management. And I think I mentioned that that was sometimes hard. Those who had the title of manager sometimes don't believe you when you say you're in charge. You have to make sure that they believe that they really are in charge and you can't make the decisions for them. Uh, that's what Covey himself experienced uh, when he was in charge of a, a certain area, a geographic area of a global corporation. Uh, when his boss said, you're in charge now, he didn't really believe his boss because the previous bosses didn't le let him really be in charge. Previous bosses would tell him what to do. And so when he tried to get the new boss to tell him what to do, the new boss would say, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You're the one there on site. You're the one that knows the problems. I can tell you some similar situations that I faced, but you have to make the decisions. That's an important part of delegation, by the way, and we'll be talking about that delegation uh, before the end of the class, too. So um, anyway, as I said, then you need to be a leader. And now management comes to comes in to implement it. So in our own lives, we're both. We have to be the leader. We have to decide what is the end goal for us. And we have to be the manager to make it happen. If we don't do both of them well, then odds are we're going to fail. We need to do both of them well. We need to know where we're going, and we need to know how to get there and 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 take all the steps, not be lazy about it, not to, uh, we'll be, we have to be smart about it, and we'll be talking about that in, in the, as part of this lesson. Uh, so being an efficient management, be an, being an efficient manager, without an effective leadership is, as one individual phrased it, like straightening the deck chairs on the Titanic. No management success can compensate for failure in leadership. But leadership is hard because we're often caught in a management paradigm. I've caught myself in that. This oil, this oil executive caught himself in that. And I come by it honestly. My dad, even though he's just a farmer, he was the farm owner. And he could not just let other people do the work. Uh, even when he was older and he had rheumatoid arthritis and he was told you have to stop working so hard or you have to leave the farm, uh, he would hire somebody to do the work. And they'd be down there slowly shoveling or whatever it was they were doing. And he'd say, get out of the way. He'd jump down and do it for them, basically. Uh, and thus, he had to ultimately leave the farm that he loved because he could not stop himself from being personally, you know, digging the ditches, so to speak. He could not stop himself. And I found myself in that situation sometimes myself, too, in, in, the, in my publishing business. Um, Goff said, things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things that matter least. Think about that. Because that is where we typically fail in life. That is one area where we typically fail is that we allow important things to be pushed aside because we're busy with the little thing. I think I, somebody else, I quoted somebody else was saying, I, would, I could do great things if I weren't so busy doing little things. And that's exactly the problem. You have to learn how to manage your time in such a way that the first things first are the important things. Not the, 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 not the things that some people might tell you are important, but you know are not important. At least not from your perspective. Um, habit uh, three the second create is the second creation. We mentioned last week that the first creation is what you're creating in your mind. Okay, that's your leadership role. You're creating your future in your mind. In habit three, now you're creating it in reality, and that again is your management function.
I'm not sure if we're going to have time to, uh, we'll come back and watch some videos if we can. Um, but I'm going to skip over it right now. One of the things that uh, Dr. Covey frequently has people do, he mentions in his, in his uh, book, but in his workshops he does it too, he, ask, he asks his students to think of one thing that they're not doing regularly, that if they did it regularly, they did it and they accomplish something uh, they know is important. What one thing that they could think of like that that would change their life? Just think about it in their career and think about it in their personal life, in both areas. What one thing could you do, could you accomplish, could you dedicate more time to, so to speak, that would change your life? What would it be? I would challenge you to think about that. Uh, right now, uh, it, may, it may be hard to come up with that because you're in the middle of your studies and people are telling you what you have to do. And I understand that that's hard for you then to think outside the box when you're a regular student. But especially once you graduate, this becomes the most one of the most important questions you can ask yourself: Is what am I not doing now that if I did it, could totally change my life? The, uh, and the reason why that's important, there's four types of things. Uh, and first off, we, you need to distinguish between what's, uh, what the, the words urgent and important. What's the difference between urgent and important in your mind? This again has become kind of a covey ease, if you spell it, it's kind of covey speak, but it makes sense once you understand it. Something urgent, typically comes from somebody else. Somebody's telling you that this is important. But when you think about it, it may not really that be that important. But somebody's telling you that it is. And they're pushing onto you a priority of doing this thing that they say is urgent when you perhaps know that it's not really that important. Something important has to come from within. You have to believe something really is important to call it important. It has to be your decision what's important. And so that takes us back to the questions I asked you. If you ask yourself, what one thing can I do in my career and in my personal life that would totally change my life, you are by definition saying this is really important. In fact, you're saying this is the most important thing I could do. If you're saying this is going to change my life, you're really saying this is the most important thing I can do. In my career, for my career, this is the most important thing I can do for my personal life. Would you make it one for each? Um, other things, uh, so there are some things that are right at the top of the list, things that are urgent and important. However, the next two are the ones where we get confused. Um, the second one that he said, the second one in his priority is something that's not urgent what we know is important. That's the second most important thing you can do every day. The thing that is that somebody may say is that, that excuse me, that that you know personally is not uh, is not urgent. Excuse me. Okay. Anyway, so uh, it's it's yeah, it's not urgent. Nobody's really telling you you have to do it. Like that's where we where you need to think about that. Nobody's telling you have to do this. Uh, in fact, even though he says that upper one is more is the most is number one, this is the one where we most mostly fail at. This is this number two, the number two item here is where most people fail. The thing that is not urgent, nobody's telling you have to do it, but you yourself know it's important. In other words, take for example, writing a book. Writing Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. When you have ten kids at home and you have a wife and you have a community service and you decide on your own, one of the most important things I can do in my life is write this book that I've been kind of studying as part of my PhD. I need to write it. And, and allocating the time necessary to write that book obviously changed Stephen Covey's life. And it actually, in the, as a result, changed the world because 40, over 40 million people have read it. 
in over 30 languages. Uh, so was it important? Obviously it's important. Did anybody tell him he had to write the book? Nobody told him he had to write the book. So that had to be a decision he made, and he had to manage his life in such a way that he could write the book. And that's where most people don't do it. They never get around to you know, writing their book, in a sense, whatever that is. Whatever that is that they think is important, they never get around to it. Uh, the, then the third most important is something that somebody tells us is urgent. But we know it's not that important. And so a lot of times people are pushing unto us saying this is important. When we know it's not important, we know it's urgent. They think it's urgent. it's urgent maybe, but it's not important. And maybe there's some way we can, is it, is it even necessary to do? They're saying you have to do this right now. You have to do it right now. And you know it's really not that important, and you're working on something important. Do you ignore them? Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes you can... Uh, depends who it is that's telling you that. In some cases, you need to learn how to ignore some people. You say something that's not urgent. This is where delegation comes in office. Because somebody else can look at you. Who doesn't have their life prioritized. Uh, or who can actually benefit from it. Maybe somebody, maybe you're a supervisor over other people. Maybe, maybe there is somebody who would actually benefit by doing this and it makes them feel more important because, after all, the boss says this is important, even though you know it's really not that important. The other person might think it's important, and they'll do it very gladly because they're doing something for the boss. While well, you're doing something really important. So you make the decision, you delegate to somebody else, even in your own family. It is sometimes more important for you to delegate to your children than it is to do it yourself. Your children are automatically, when you have children, they're automatically going to say, Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. That's so hard, Dad. And then they start very young. You tell them, go find your shoes, Johnny. And they go in for one time. I can't find my shoes, Mom. What are they doing? Okay. And because somebody has to find the shoes, and they don't want it to be them. Does the mom come out and say, Johnny, I can't find your shoes? No. She's going to look till she finds the shoes, right? And so that kind of people are like that. They want to push off onto you something they don't want to do, and you have to resist that. Even to the management level, as I'm mentioning, the Covey with his boss, uh, that oil, the oil uh, president who had to force his managers to manage because they were used to him doing it for them, or me and my business, or my dad and his business. There are times when you just say, you have to delegate if you're going to be an effective, an effective leader. You can't be doing it yourself. Um, learning from my dad when I was in the publishing business, even though he was, that's a very different business than farming, I felt like I have to show my employees by being the one who, who right out in their front lines doing all this work. So they know I, it's not below my level. I, I can be out there working as hard as they can. But in the process, I didn't take the time sometimes to lead and to come up with the ideas and, the, uh, and make the contacts and do the stuff I needed to do to help the, the business uh, really progress the way it should. So I needed to delegate to somebody else. And it's not because I don't mind, I don't, I don't mind doing the grunt work, so to speak. But if I'm doing the grunt work, who's going to do the leadership work? They can't do the leadership work. I'm the boss. I have to do the leadership work. And so there are times when you, you may feel like I did, that I had to show them that I'm not, not too proud to do the grunt work, like my dad's not too proud to jump in and dig the ditches, but then it, he has to retire and get off the farm because he can't stop himself. Um, so you can cause some major problems to yourself and your business if you don't understand how to delegate. And actually, it, like I said, it is important People who can delegate, it can benefit them in their growth, just like it benefits Johnny if you say, Johnny, we're just not going to go to the park if you can't find your shoes. I'm not going to find your shoes for you. And make Johnny go back and find his shoes. And so he doesn't think that, that all he has to do is walk in there for one second and come out, I can't find my shoes, I'm going to find them for you. Uh, you don't let him do, do that, even if he's a you know, three-year-old, 
it's time it's he needs to grow up the same as if a, a manager is doing the same thing you have 50 year old children who are still trying to push their work on onto, onto you or on somebody else you can't let them do it uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide to make my point here you can see it um, yeah. So he, he makes a, a time management matrix out of this. Quadrant one are things that are urgent and important. So that is your first priority, things that are urgent and important, both of them. But your second priority should be the thing that is important but not urgent. That should be your priority. We sometimes get trapped in quadrant three which are things that are not really that important, but somebody's telling us are urgent. And they might even use the word important. This is important, Ken, you have to do this. You have to do this now. And we know it's not important. It's urgent, maybe. It's some more paperwork that, that AA is trying to push off on us uh, to make themselves look good, but it's not that important. Um, it's actually taking time from our teaching. It makes us worse teachers because they want us to fill out some more forms. Um, not, not important. Urgent to them, not important to us. Um, Everybody knows that's our time wasters. Watching TV, uh, sitting there, you know, on our social media, uh, you know, stuff like that, whatever. Things that we do that are neither important nor urgent, that we're just kind of wasting our time. Now, something can be in both two and four, however such as exercise. Exercise is part of two. It is important to keep yourself fit physically, uh, and so that makes it part of, of uh, quadrant two, which not urgent, nobody says you have to exercise, but it's really important that you do exercise enough to keep yourself physically fit. And so that makes it quadrant two, but then if all you do is play basketball in all your free time, that's now you've gone overboard and now you have to fit some of that into quadrant four. Now you're doing, you're going overboard with something. So you're spending every, you know, all your extra time uh, taking walks or riding the bicycle. Uh, somebody, uh, I was at a speech the other day at a meeting where somebody gave a speech where they, uh, they rode their bicycles all the way across America, 4,000 kilometers. Um, and now the husband is writing something, he's doing something like writing 30, mi 30 kilometers every morning and 40 every night. Well, unless he's really a world-class athlete and he's gonna get some benefit out of this, I'd say he's gone too far uh, because it doesn't sound to me like he's spending any time with his wife. Um, he, he's, he's spent all his time riding a bicycle. And while I'm sure he's in excellent shape, I couldn't do that. Uh, what is the end and goal? What's the goal in mind? Why are you riding 70 kilometers every day in your bicycle? What, what is the purpose of this? Um, so I don't know. And maybe he has a good purpose. Maybe he is world class. Maybe he is going to make money out of it or whatever. I don't know. That's a case where I, you know, I would put some of that under quadrant four, uh, but I don't know. Uh, so um, uh, this is kind of redundant to what we said before. I'm going to skip that, and I'm going to maybe come back to this. We have time. Uh, so again, some, what, what does fall in some of these categories under uh, quadrant one, urgent and important, crises, certainly pressing problems, deadline-driven projects that are important projects, things that are part of your work that you need to do. Um, I'm going to jump down to three, however things that are urgent but not important. Uh, this is uh, interruptions. So as a faculty member, I need to close my door once in a while. I tend to have an open door policy. If you, so if you want to come talk to me and I'm there, I'll talk to you. But if it happened too much, I might not be able to do that. Uh, if too many people came in and took my time, right now nobody comes to see me, so I'm not worried about it right now. But if it were a constant Inter interruption of my research, a constant interruption of, of some of the other stuff I need to do, my preparation for classes, then I would have to 
lock the door sometimes. Um, it's not a problem right now. Um, some mail, uh, or especially email. You know, some of the email is really important that I go through all this advertising that people are sending to me, or uh, all this, uh, is it important that I go through uh, Facebook uh, every day and look at all this stuff? Uh, you know, it might be interesting to me, but is it, you know, is it important? Maybe some of it might even relate to my work. Uh, for example, as a communications professor, social media is part of my work. Uh, I, I, I didn't pay it much attention at all to social media until Barack Obama became, used social media to become president of the United States. And I realized he had done something that nobody else had ever done before. He was the first social media president. Um, and, and then uh, Trump uh, kind of did the same thing. Uh, Trump didn't spend nearly as much money um, as Hillary did. Uh, and a lot, and they, they kept saying, he's going to lose, he can't win, he's going to lose, he's going to lose. And he won by using social media and it made a really big push at the last moment. Uh, so uh, something can be both part of your work and can also be part of the wasted time, a little bit of both. So you have to analyze what you're doing with your time to figure out where does this fall and what do I do about it. Um, you know, some meetings, uh, in fact, that uh, the guy I told you to remember his name uh, last week, uh, the inventor of management, uh, said that one of the worst things people do is have meetings. Uh, when leaders have too many meetings, it's just wasting their time. And they're just basically taking time away from uh, their employees who want to be working. That's also was part of the uh, uh, last week, uh, I sent you an email to emphasize, I think I talked about it in this class, but I didn't in the other one, uh, that the survey did of, of workers and how uh, many of them thought that only about half of what they did had anything to do with achieving the main goals of the company. When they answer the question like that, they're basically saying half of my time I'm wasting, that somebody's having me do paperwork and stuff that I don't think is very valuable. Uh, so even in a corporate sense, sometimes we as a corporation um, end up giving people busy work that's not important. I feel that a lot of time, uh, I made reference to it already, but the academic affairs is pushing a lot of paperwork on us that I've never seen at other universities. And I think it's a waste of time. Uh, I've heard a number of Western professors who are used to living, uh, you know, working in a Western university who thinks this is making me a worse teacher. They're having us do paperwork they think will make us a better teacher, but it's taking so much of our time is making us a worse teacher. And so uh, corporately, sometimes uh, we, we end up screwing things up for our employees. Um, anyway, so you can take a look at your life and, and see where things fall. So which one, I, which one did I say is most likely to make a difference in your life? Which of the quadrants? I just told you. Which one will probably make the difference whether you are a winner or a loser in life? Everybody's going to try to do one. Everybody's going to try to do one. You see, so, so one is important and it's urgent, but that's not hard for you to do. Everybody does one. What everybody doesn't do is two. Two is the one where people let three and four kick up their time and they never get around to doing two. That's the example of Stephen Covey writing his book. Nobody said he had to write the book. He could have easily filled up his time with the other three quadrants, easily, especially with 10 kids. I mean, there's always something to do with 10 kids. Uh, so he, he could very, very, very easily have spent all of his time on quadrants one, three, and four and never gotten to writing his book, which is two. And that's why he asked the question, what one thing can you do for your career and one thing you could do for your personal life that if you did it, would totally change your life? And by definition, that's number two. You don't have to do it. You're not doing it now. But if you did it, you yourself is saying, or you are saying, this would change my life. But you're not doing it. Why not? Because we're caught up in one, three, and four. That's why. 
So the average person will fail uh, to achieve many of their goals in life because they it falls under number two. It's something important that, that nobody says they have to do. And they don't tell themselves they have to do it. One thing you can do with that, by the way, is when you, what Dr. Covey says is put all your ones and twos at the top of your day timer. On the top of your schedule for the day, put ones and twos. And do those first. Then when you have time, do three. And if you have some time after that, then you can do four. But do one and two first before you ever get to, to three and four. Because one and two are the ones that will make the difference. And two is the one that will make the biggest difference in the sense that it's the one that nobody's doing. Everybody's doing one, nobody's doing two, except you, if you choose to do it. So the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Understand the difference? So, you need to put a different mindset to it. You need to make sure at the top of your list are the important things. And you do those before you do anything else. Then you get to the other stuff that's not that important, uh, whether, it's, whether it's or not it's urgent. Don't let somebody else now, what happens, what happens if your boss comes to you and, and he gives you a, a, a quadrant three job to do? Here, do this. This is, this is important, he says. This is important. Well, you know it's not important. You know it's urgent. Difference. But he's using the word important. Your boss is saying, this is important. You have to do this. But meanwhile, you're doing some other things for the company, for, for the organization, that really is. They really are important. So what do you do when the boss comes in with something not important? He calls it important, but it's not really important. You know that. Here, do this. Do this right now. This is important. Not important. It's urgent. Difference. So what do you do when the boss does that to you? What do you think? You say, hell no, get out of here. No. Obviously, you're not going to do that. You're not going to have the job much longer. Um, but that happened to Stephen Covey. He was, uh, you know, in upper management at the university where I graduated. And uh, his boss came in to him and said, Stephen, uh, this is important. Could you take care of this today? And he started to walk out. And Dr. Covey said, uh, excuse me, sir, wait a second. Uh, I just wanted to show you, and he may have gone out. He said, uh, I was working on this project here. That I think is really important. Um, and I was also working on this one here that I think is really important. Now, if you want me to do this other one, I'll do it. But I've, I've been trying to concentrate on these two. What do you suppose the boss said? Somebody else do it. Thank you. Somebody else. Somebody else who wouldn't, who, who didn't bother to tell him I'm doing something else important. Um, now, if the boss still said, well, just do this first anyway, well, what are you going to do? You're going to do it. The boss makes it a number one priority. The, the boss puts it into first quadrant. Uh, even if you think it's not, he's your boss, he puts it into first quadrant, whether you like it or not. But, but you can question it. You can question it. If you're working on something else that he needs you to do, and you raise, you, you show him, you know, these, I'm working on these two important projects. If you want me to take the time to do this project three, I will. But I just want you to remember what I'm working on. Uh, then um, very likely he's going to find somebody else to do it. Do the urgent thing that's not that important. And let you stay on the projects that are important. So there are ways to get around it. Um, even if it's your boss telling you that this is important and it's not. Uh, a lot of other people tell you things are important, too. Once you're married, you're going to find a spouse telling you lots of things are important. Um, and you may know, may be pretty sure they're not that important. Um, and so there are times when you may have to have that discussion with your wife or your husband as well. 
uh, what what is appropriate, what what it, for you to spend your time on, and what's not. Um, that doesn't mean you always say no to your spouse by any means. You're not going to have a spouse any longer. Um, but there may be some negotiating to be done uh, in order for you to uh, really do the things that you think are a priority. And your wife can can should be able to respond in the same way. You say, "Honey, I'm I'm willing to do it, but I'm working on this new job application for that job that would pay me 50% more." But if you want me to go take the kids to the park, I, I'll do that. But and your wife's gonna say, "No, I want more money. <laughs> I'll, I'll take him to the, I'll take him to the park or whatever." So um, we must have the discipline to prioritize our day-to-day -day actions based on what is most important, not what is most urgent. We should plan according to the nature of things, not according to the perceived. You know, or this, again, watch out for that word, important. Usually it's not true. Usually when somebody says important, they mean urgent. And urgent is not important, necessarily. It can be both. But many times in our lives, somebody's going to try to tell us something is important, important, and we know it isn't that important. And so they're trying to catch us in a trap here to try to get us to do something they don't want to do themselves, probably. Um... Or they're just being good managers and they're trying to delegate. But if you're like Stephen Covey, you, that's, that's part of the delegation. You say, I'll do that project three that isn't that important if you want me to, but I'm trying to do this for you. I'm trying to make you look better by doing these two important things. You really want me to do project three? And the boss is going to decide, no, of course, project one and two are much important. I'll find somebody else that's not doing anything important. And he'll go find somebody else to do that urgent thing that's not important. And so your boss or your spouse or whatever can urgent can respond properly once you explain the situation. Um, anyway, as long as you're if you're doing if you're really prioritizing. If you're really putting the important things at the top, including quadrant two things, not things that somebody says are important, but things that really are important, then uh, your life's going to be much better. Uh, you're actually going to be accomplishing things that other people are not accomplishing. And so that's, and that's important. Again, we, we looked at this, uh, if not, I'm not sure if I use this graphic, but we talked about this last week. We have our mission statement, we consider our roles, and we establish our goals. Well, that's that's basically the leadership portion there, right? Uh, you know, we're 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 making we're making our long-term decisions on that top row. Now we're making our management decisions in the bottom row. You know, we're we're looking at our roles, we're looking at our goals, now we're making plans for today and this week. We're making our very specific plans of things we need to accomplish based on their importance, based on their importance, right? And we schedule it and we de delegate. Again, m most people are not good delegators. Um, so, and right now you probably have a lot of things you cannot delegate. But as you get older, there will be people you can delegate to. Um, and you should remember the importance of delegation. That's one way to get rid of quadrant three items that are not important. Find somebody to delegate to. Uh, even me, for example, frankly, uh, I decided to hire an assistant out of my own pocket. I decided not to wait for the university to, to pay for an assistant. They started thinking about it in those terms right there. I can I can pay, you know, 400 ringgit to, to a student to do a lot of this stuff that's not important, so I have more time to do stuff important. Is it, is it, is it that valuable enough for me? Absolutely. I get paid a pretty good salary, frankly. Uh, so to have that extra time to devote to things that are really important yeah, I, I'll gladly. I, the more I thought about it, the more it made sense to pull that money out of my own pocket and, and give to my assistant 
Um, I, I've applied for a grant to, to try to get the university to pay for, for an assistant, but I'll probably keep two assistants then. I, I think it's important enough I'll continue to pay one assistant out of my pocket and let the university pay for another assistant because I need somebody to delegate to. Without an assistant, I have nobody to delegate to. And so that means I did, did get to do all the junk. Um, that's not important. That's urgent, not important. So it makes sense for me, to, even out of my own pocket, to here at a university where somebody else should be paying for it, um, I'm doing it myself. OK. Um, we're about out of time, and I don't think we really don't have time to uh, watch any of these videos. I'm sorry I took too much time talking about uh, presentations, and we took that a little extra time on the presentation, so we end up stealing some time from our from our videos. Um, there are Okay, so there's not very many videos to watch. Oops. Well, there's one long one. Um, yeah. Thank you. I would say definitely watch the first three. Watch. Well, the first two are from Covey. The third one. Uh, was from Covey, but they took that one off of YouTube, so I replaced it with another one. Uh, so definitely the first three are going to be on your quiz for sure, and they also reinforce what I'm talking about in class here. So the first three, definitely watch those. They only accumulate to uh, well, that's 17, 23 minutes to watch those first three. If you don't watch all of four, if you just if you stop at one hour, I think you're okay. So if it's 23 on the first three videos, and then uh, that would be 37 minutes of the 50 minutes of the fourth one, I, you're fine. You've gotten enough out of the fourth one. If you like it and you want to keep watching it, of course, keep watching it. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll say I'll guarantee there will be no questions from number four that are not in the first uh, 27 minutes. Okay? So there will be no questions from the last 23 minutes of it. So. At the most, um, like I say, there's 60 minutes. If you watch only 23 minutes, or excuse me, 27 minutes of the last one, that'll make exactly one hour. Okay, any questions on anything? Anything? As soon as I say you can go, everybody comes up here to ask me questions. I know how that goes. You can't trick me again. Um, any questions that I can answer for any of you because other people have the same question, I'm sure. Okay, well then we'll call it a day. Thank you. So, uh, a very good evening to Dr. Ken, my fellow friends. So, my name is Anne, and he's Hao Yan Beng, Chen Yan, Kylie, and Ray Wei. So today we are going to give a presentation on you and your college life. So first, I want to ask you guys a question. Does anyone of you know the difference between high school and college life? Okay, nobody knows. Okay, so actually, both of, both of the college and the high school are actually the essential stages of learning for everyone. And second, our role still remains the same, which is as a student to equip ourselves with the knowledge uh, so that we can use for the rest of our lives. So school life was much more innocent compared to the uh, college life. So college is the life of freedom. Why I say that? Because college life in a college is a place, a bigger place and a broader platform for us to and can broaden our horizon, which can, because we can interact with different people, come from different places, backgrounds and also cultures. So 22nd September 2017 was my first day in here, in this campus. So this is a place where we are assumed to be an adult because we need to be more mature, uh, independent and responsible for our actions. 
So as, as you all can see, we prepare a box here. So this box, this, this box is simply representing our university, which is SMUM. So now let's, uh, let's check it out what's the page inside. Okay, so you can see there's a lot of cups here, and we got some trees and buildings. So everyone has to actually go and buy. And also it. So actually this part represents the people in the campus. So in the campus for sure we got students, we got lecturers, we got staff, we got workers, and etc. So we will meet more people come from more diverse background in a college, and hence not all the college students are the same. So basically, we've got three types of students in a college. So the first time, the first one, first one is the traditional student. And the second one is the returning student. And the third one is other students group. So it's important to understand which type of students you are and what kinds of difficulties you may face in college because this may help you a lot in your college experience. So now I'll pass it to my teammate to be way to talk about the traditional student. Hi, my name is Rui Wei. So now I'm going to talk about the first cup which represents the traditional students. So basically, so basically there's something inside these cups, right? So what is uh, so let's now assume that inside this cup is the thinking of students and the items inside these cups will be the problems that they're going to face. Okay, so what is traditional students? Traditional students is the uh, refers to post-secondary students which between 18 to 22 years old who enrolls directly from high school and attend full-time classes. So, uh, besides that, coming directly from um, coming directly or almost directly from high school, uh, the traditional students uh, already used get used in attending classes, reading textbook, and studying. Thus, they may find that the transition to college is much more easier. Okay. So, I believe that majority of us falls in this category. Do you guys agree? Yes. Okay. So, um. Now, so um, so the problem, the first problem that the traditional students may face is time management. So uh, unlike high school, unlike high school, the college courses may, uh, requires much more effort than the courses in high school classes did. May requires in high school classes day. So what we can do is that um, okay. So may I ask some? Uh, may I ask you guys? Is there anyone here sleep um, before 12 a.m.? You good? And then the rest. Oh, you good? And then the rest. So I suppose most of us are night owls, right? So I do believe that me, we also, we also may be skip class, especially the morning class, right? So having poor time management will lead to um, poor academic pro uh, poor academic performance, which finally leads us to obtain poor grades. So that's why I'm saying that we must have um, a good time management so that we can. So we need to maintain a good time management so that we can. So having poor time management will lead to unproductive academic performance, which will finally lead to stopping progress. Some students may end up dropping out if they couldn't adjust themselves in taking. Uh, may, uh, may end up dropping out if they couldn't adjust to the freedom of college. So time management is really important, and the solution to this problem is to um, we can make a schedule for our study time and leisure time, and we make sure that you must uh, follow the timetable that you have set. 
Besides that, you must also have self-discipline. Okay? All right. Uh, Moving on is the second one. The second problem will be homesickness. So it is common for us that we will feel lonely and helpless when we first time moving away from home. So from my personal experience, from my personal experience, I have no friends at all in the beginning when I first came to SMUN. So I began to feel lonely and helpless within the first few weeks. I miss my parents, I miss my hometown, and I miss my most importantly is my I miss my hometown food. So what I did is every weekend I'll just go back to my hometown to name by faith. But to be honest, it is but to be honest, it is very um, expensive to buy flight ticket, right? So my parents just banned me away from go on, me from going home as the thing that it's time for me to be independent and it's time for me to be independent. It's time for me to it's time for me to be independent and most importantly it's not waste too much money to buy flight ticket. So now I already uh, solved the problem and I already get used to the environment and the food over here. Sometimes I will even travel to other places. I will even travel to other places that uh, during some break, instead of going back home. And guess what? Now it's my parents turn to ask me to go back home. So what I'm trying to say is that homesickness is just a small matter. You can manage this problem by making plans to be around others. Besides that, uh, you can join societies or groups. Trust me, the companionship will lift up your mood and reduce the feeling of isolation. So last but not least is social problem. So it is common for us to have uh, a, it's common for it, uh, we did have a lot of times with our friends in campus, right? So some some students may some traditional students may face problems like having conflict with their roommates or groupmates. Some of them may even uh, affected by immoral friends, immoral friends, which will uh, eventually cause their character to be corrupted. So therefore, it's very common for an individual to lose their to lose to lose their identity. To lose their identity as they may, uh, as a result of negative peer pressure. Okay. So, um, what we can do is we must study our friend's character first before we build a strong tie with them. That's all from me, and I'll pass it to Kali. Okay, so my name is Kindly. So the next type of students we can see here is returning students. So what is returning students? Returning students normally refer to those who have worked for quite a number of years, and after that, they return back to study. So for them, they are normally older than traditional students, and they are more mature, more goal-driven. They know what they want, and they know what they hope to gain from the education. So they will choose us all the causes carefully. So for um, returning students, they are financially and psychologically independent because they are um, used to living on their own. So since they are paying their tuition fee by themselves, they want to get the money worth. They seldom live in the hostel and some of them might already have family. They might have children already. So for returning students, since they decided to come back to study after um, quite a number of years, so they are more serious type of students and they have high motivations in doing all the coursework. And besides this, they are having good problem solving skills and good decision making skills because they face more real world situations and they are full of experiences. However, they do face some challenges in their campus lives. So for example, we got part-time students and also full-time students. For part-time students, they need to focus their work, they are committed to their work. And for those returning students that already have family members, they need to commit to their family. 
So for them, it's difficult to focus work, study, and family at the same time. So um, it might be stress stressful for some of them. So next, yes, we can see money inside. So for returning students, normally they will face financial problem, especially to those who are who are full time returning students because they need to pay everything expenses by themselves, they are financially independent. So all their living has to depend on the saving. For full-time returning students, they might take unpaid leave to return back to study, which means that during the period of studying, they do not receive any salary. So it means that um, during the period of studying, they need to, all their living costs have to depend on the saving. For those who have insufficient saving, it might be a problem for them due to lack of financial resources, and they have to change their lifestyles. And let's see what else inside. Okay, it's a watch. Normally, for returning students, they also lack of time, especially to those part-time returning students, and also those who already have family, because they are responsible to their family members, and also responsible to their work. So they have to, um, they normally have a very busy schedule. They spend less time with the lecturer and classmates, and they also have less lack of time to spend in the extracurricular and campus activities. And that's a, another thing that quite special for returning students is they don't like to study all the theory stuff. For them, um, they more prefer to study practical things such as coursework and like doing project or survey because they used to face all the real world situations. They know what the real society wants. So for them, the practical things are more interested for them and they would say no to theories. They seldom like to study theories. So in order to solve the returning students' problems, it, I think that the university, university should provide some financial aid such as scholarship for them. And I think that all the university has psychological counseling center, which the students can go and consult the psychologist there, um, ask for some professional advices to solve their stress problem, reduce their stress. And also, I think that it's important for the returning students to have good communication with the lecturer and also boss, so that the lecturer and boss can tolerate them and yeah, tolerate them and stop give them less workloads. So for also, I think that it's very very important for the returning students that already have family to have good communication with their family members to gain understanding for them or from them. Um, although the challenges of returning to college to study as an adult learners are real, but these are not the struggles to, that you have to take on alone. So just remember the reason why you came back to study. Give in all your effort and you will ultimately reach your success. So next I will give you to you. So good afternoon everyone. My name is Chen Ying. So we classify students under traditional students and returning students into the other student category. So do you know what is other student groups? No? Okay, let me explain. So students in this group are affected by some other common programs which will make them have a different college experience. And students in this group may be either traditional student by age or returning student. So next, I'm going to focus on two types of other student groups that commonly have in average college. So the first type is, tradition, uh, is international student. Most of them are coming from a different culture and possibly speaking English as a second language. So they may, so they may encounter cultural differences and culture shock at college. As an international student, I totally understand this type of program. And because we cannot, we cannot change the environment, I think we should actively change ourselves to fit into it. 
uh, so we can make some cultural adjustment and accommodation, such as meet more local friends and learn more about the local culture. Some university will assign an international student department for international students to help them settle down in that country or help them to solve some problem they faced in that country. And besides, language issue can be the greatest problem to overcome because, because international students have to use English almost every day. And what's more, English skill is also an important part of college to evaluate students' abilities. So I think international students should practice and study English very hard in order to get good grade and a greater integrate into the local life. At some college, such as our university, Shaman University, Malaysia, um, have um, provides a lot of English lessons for international students to attend. And our university also has an English lunch where you can practice your English there. And the staff there are all very friendly and are willing to help us. So I think it's a good practice that can be used by other college to, to help international students on, English, on language issue. And the second part is students with disabilities. After searching on the internet, we found that the problem, the problem that disabled students face at college are Some college provides limited place for disabled students to, en to enter the majors and colleges. And besides, and besides, some disabled students also feel inconvenient about living in college because some people around them may use different perspectives to judge them. So I think to solve this kind of problem. The government should set up some law to prohibit college from discriminating disabled students to enter majors and college. And what's more, college should also build some buildings and dormitory for these disabled students because disabled students also have the equal right to use the campus facilities. That's all for me. Next, I will pass it to Yang Ping. So, hi everyone, my name is Yang Feng, and based on what is presented by my teammate just now, there are so many types of different, there are so many types of students around us. These differences are caused by a lot of factors, which are background, family background, condition, and personality. And that's why uh, we have different types of learning styles. Um, however, it is impossible for a lecturer to teach in a way that could suit everyone in the class. We are not only having 20 or 30 something students in the class, but it could be up to hundreds. So the lecturer will uh, use only one method to teach all students in the class, just like this. So, uh, it's now up for us, who are the college students, to adapt, to find our ways to adapt to these environments. And basically, the learning styles are divided into four main categories. The first one is visual learners, which they can absorb the information through images. And then the second one is auditory learners, which they study the best through listening. And then the third one will be kinesthetic learners. These are learners like to participate in activities and solve problems in a hands-on manner. And the last learners will be reading and writing learners, which they would uh, best at gaining information through reading and writing. As for me, I will fall under the category of reading and writing. I will Go for you. Uh, sorry. Go for Google instead of using YouTube because I find that it makes me remember the most. So, uh, moving on to the learning process. So the, the first stage will be 
preparing. We need to make sure that we go to a class earlier so that we have enough time to uh, to get ourselves ready for the lectures. We also need to uh, look through the particular notes from the lectures that will be taught in the coming class. And then the next stage will be absorbing. We have to pay full attention in the class so we can absorb the information as much as possible. The following stage will be capturing, always taking notes that uh, to summarize the main points that are easy to be remembered. And then the last stage will be reviewing. So we have to always read through the previous notes so that we can always get refreshed with the information we obtain. And so I would say that uh, we get much freedom in the college as we just attend the class and submit the assignments on time. In college, we have to manage our time and organize the things all by ourselves. The lecturers will be there to guide us only, but not teach us teach us step by step. So we have to manage our time and self-discipline wisely in order to achieve uh, excellence in the academic performance. Besides that, we also need to take part into extracurricular activities as we can develop many skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, leadership skills, and communication skills. These are very useful for future. And college life is not just about academic, it's more than that. Most importantly, a college student has to choose a right pathway to, uh, in order to be successful in college life. So now I will pass to Annie to conclude our topic. Okay, so like the three changes between school and college. So the success, the mean of success was not just attending high grades in test or exam, but and here everyone has a different meaning of success. So by organizing an event successfully, or you actively involved in a club or society can be a success, as well as you brave to learn something new in life can also be a success for someone else. So it's great that you can get the best grade you can get in the test or exam. But keep in mind, a high GPA can make us feel competitive, but it's not everything. So we not only learn the knowledge or theories in books, but we also learn the values that we can apply in life and here. So uh, the college life molds us in, every, in many ways through teamwork and extra paper activities. And this uh, and all these have just helped us to develop a great personality. So we take responsibility for our own study, time, money, social relationship, and even lifestyle. So Stephen Covey stated that 90% 90 90 of life is decided by how you react. So we actually have the freedom to choose. With the right and positive attitude, I think that we are able to find and create ourselves to be a successful college student. So this was not just a campus for us anymore, but will become the most precious memory in our life that we will cherish forever. So ask yourself, who are you really? Decide who you are and be the one you think of. Find yourself, be brave, work hard, play hard, and I hope you guys enjoy the campus life and achieve success in college. So that's the end of our presentation. I hope you guys enjoy it, and if there is any question, we will please answer them. Thank you very much. going to make a few comments on, on uh, uh, what we experienced with the first group so that everybody else can kind of learn from them. Uh, at the same time, I'll tell you, because they're the first group, 
Um, if they made a few mistakes, uh, I'll be a little bit lenient on that because they haven't had a chance to, to see any, make, make any mistakes yet. Um, there were um, Well, I guess there's a couple of things I'd point out with what they did. First off, uh, some of you are, are like them, are going to want to do something um, different. Okay, we'll call it that. And it is memorable, and that's one of the things that, that we check off. Whenever somebody tries to do something different, however, what I experience is that it almost takes more time. It always takes more time to get started. And so we really didn't get started until quarter after, and part of that was perhaps my fault, uh, but so a lot of it was, it was different. And so we end up taking, you know, 15 minutes extra. They really didn't get started till quarter after, till 15 after. So it took the right amount of time to present, but it took more time to set up because we had to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, so that's a problem uh, that maybe we can, um, I guess make sure that I that I know we're going to be facing something like that, so I can for sure. I should have known. They did kind of warn me. I should have been here right at 10 minutes tell. Um, and I guess the other class was. I think they moved their class. So I, I, I was still in my mind thinking we would have people who are sitting still sitting here at, at 10 minutes tell. Um, so uh, for this class, I will try to come. Uh, you know, right, be here by 10 tell, and let's be sure to be up here, team be up here, especially if you're doing something different. But even if you're not, just making sure we have the PowerPoint uh, loaded and everything ready to go so that right on the hour we can get started uh, so so that we don't lose 15 minutes in the process. Um, the uh, I can't say a couple of other things. First off, let me say they're very good presenters. Uh, that's why they had the courage to uh, be number one, I'd say. Uh, they did their best not to use any notes. They had it pretty well memorized, uh, or at least you know they were able to you know, ad lib, whatever you want to call that. Um, the uh, their presentation and keep eye contact. That's on the critique sheet is eye contact. Uh, they they were um, quite articulate, uh, enunciated quite clearly. There wasn't anything where I had a hard time understanding. Um, they did a really good job with that. Um, one question I would have is, was uh, was the subject they, they spent most of the time on worth the amount of time they put into that? Uh, in other words, for example, how many, how many non-traditional students do we actually have at Chimen? How many, how many uh, return students do we have here? I don't know if we have any, frankly. Uh, most of you are coming right out of high school. Is anybody not coming out of high school? Is anybody not a traditional student, student by their definition that's in this class? I, I, it's, there's very few students. And so and, you know, I've been tempted to even just you know, cut out. What, chapter one is, has some really important stuff on it. But the definition of what type of students there is probably not the most important part. Let me put it that way. Um, and so I want you to be discriminating in what you use. I would have cut that part way down if I was them. I'm not even sure I would have included it. I would have included some of the concepts were good, like the problems that students can face. And so the, the, the problems that most of you face are uh, the ones under traditional students. I am international students. A lot of you are international, so you have that problem too. I'm not sure I would have even bothered to define the different types of students. Just gone straight to the sort of problems that you face and presume that most of you are traditional and many of you are international. Just gone don't, straight to those problems and discuss those problems. But when you, when you do your presentation, uh, ask yourself the question, so what? What I'm presenting, so what? Is what I'm presenting important to, to you, the students in this class? Uh, you know, so that basically I'm asking that question on the part of you, because you're asking if, if, if they're covering, if any group covers stuff that isn't very interesting and doesn't, isn't right, doesn't really pertain to you, in your mind, more or less, you're saying, so what? 
uh, what do I need to, why do I need to know about returning students? Um, or the definitions of the different types of students. You do need to, it is good to cover the problems that you sometimes face and how can you address those problems. That, that part of that part of the chapter is good. You understand what I'm saying? So just be discriminating. Decide what in your chapter is important. Cover that. Um, I think some of the last part, different learning styles and stuff, might be the most important part. And it was kind of glossed over a little bit. Um, so what I what I suggested when people come up and talk to me, what do we cover? What do we cover? You know, there's however many pages, 30 pages in our chapter. We can't cover everything. You're absolutely right. You can't. And that's exactly, that's one reason why, that reason plus the so what question is why you need to decide as a group what's important to cover. And then try to figure out how to cover that. Somebody also asked me, can we add some outside material? I said, basically maybe if you're gonna present for uh, 30 minutes, maybe 10 minutes you can. Your, your minimum is 20 minutes. So I would say cover at least 20, uh, dedicate at least 20 minutes to what's in the book. And then if you want to bring some stuff from outside, then up to 10 minutes would be maximum from out of, outside of the book. And so if you find that there's a lot of boring stuff in your chapter, uh, you can bring in some outside stuff. It should somehow to re relate, however, to what you're talking about. It shouldn't be something totally different. It should be somehow related to your subject. So. That's also a possibility. Um, if you if you feel like the book has not given you enough material on something you really think is important, you can go outside of the book. Um, the other thing, um, the the critique sheet asks you to create questions. They do have questions in their PowerPoint. They didn't review the questions with you all. I, I would like you to go ahead and and also it says on the critique sheet. Um, did the presenters provide good multiple choice questions that can be used in a class, um, uh, in a class quiz? Sorry, I missed the last word. Uh, so they should be multiple choice. Uh, theirs were kind of open-ended, what they put, did put in their PowerPoint for me. Um, but also just take a few minutes and give people the answers. Go ahead and show it to them. I'll put it on Moodle so people can look at the questions as part of the learning process. And uh, and so when, in your presentation, give everybody the answers. Um, you can make them guess first if you have enough time. If you're not running out of time, you can go ahead and see who, who what answer people think it is or whatever uh, and make it interactive a little bit if you have time. If you don't, then just give them the answers and, uh, and call it good, okay? So again, um, I think they did very good. They're gonna get a good grade. Um, Again, I'm, I'm going to not pay too much attention to what I consider some errors and in their judgment and coverage and so forth. Um, they did an excellent job presenting, uh, good, great eye contact, great enunciation. Um, you know, all the presentation skills were, were very good. And so that part uh, is, is can, uh, excellent. So, okay. Um, I did want to uh, just uh, emphasize a few points from there as I pulled a couple of their slides out and created another one. Uh, the, the book does suggest uh, a profile. This could have been, uh, it, was kind of, it was kind of covered, but kind of hit and miss. It could have been covered a little bit uh, more item by item. Uh, pro a profile of a successful student has these four, at least these four. Maybe the, the book may have mentioned a few others too. They did mention time man management. That would be one. Uh, effective strategies in taking notes. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, note taking, besides, I, I've mentioned before, one reason why I took meticulous notes as a student, and I credit that with very excellent grades that I got, was uh, partly because I'm out the 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 lecturer, the, the professor, because the professor is going to tell me what he thinks the most important thing in the chapter is, uh, typically. And so um, by the way he presents, you can kind of guess what's going to be on the, on the, on the exam uh, because they're going to emphasize what's important to them. 
So part of taking notes is, is recording specifically what they're saying as an indication of what is important to them. Another reason is when you take notes, um, they mention the types of, of learning there is. Um, what is which of these is note taking? Is this does this fall into any of these? Uh, when you're taking notes, that's kinesthetic. Your your hands are moving; they're doing something. So that is a kinesthetic type of learning. Is and so if some of you may have gone to schools that that taught English, and one of that and one of the things they taught you, or one of the things they had you do, was write new words multiple times, because that's kinesthetic learning. Um, and obviously, you're also seeing it, and you're and, and you're spending that time memorizing it, but it's also kinesthetic. Uh, your your hands are moving, and that will help you remember it. Um, so, um, going back where I was. Uh, so, note taking can be extremely important. Um, I I always took the next step, however, um, and that was note the notes I take, and sometimes kind of hard to read. And so, before my exam, I would rewrite all my notes. And so again, I'd inst I would inst institute kinesthetic learning again, uh, and that extra time it took as I was writing to visually uh, see the material and and uh, and connect and capture it uh, is one of the words they they uh, uh, used uh, in in how to um, in the cycle of learning uh, was capture. Um, that to me is kind of a visual thing as I'm as I'm. Uh, uh, looking at material and stuff, I'm capturing that image in my mind uh, and capturing in the process and I'm capturing the most important parts uh, of the lecture. And so as I, w you know, so before the exam, I'd rewrite all my, I'd pull out of my notes the most important stuff and I would put it uh, in a, on a card. And that's what I would then be studying. Once I wrote it down in the card, then I'd be studying cards, like flashcards, uh, to prepare for that exam. So uh, that's what I would use uh, as my note-taking strategy was take as many notes as I could of what I thought was important, copy those notes again late, right before an exam, and, uh, and that would, like I say, recapture it visually and use my kinesthetic learning uh, to capture it. Uh, develop uh, critical thinking skills. Um, you know, again, basically, um, in fact, part of the purpose of having the uh, the uh, self-reflective journal is for this purpose. I don't want you just to memorize what Covey teaches and so forth. I want you to think about what it means to you. And that's the most that's the most important critical thinking you do in this class. So what to me? So what to me? What does this material mean to me and my life and my future? Um, and so that is a, a very important type of critical thinking as you apply what we learn in this class to your own to your own lives. Uh, that, by the way, I will come back to that in a second. Um, what I was saying earlier about how what I do with my notes is also part of uh, uh, of taking preparing for a test, as I mentioned. Is I just I totally rewrite the important parts of my notes. Uh, so again, reapply kinesthetic learning, create a flashcard so I can look at the flashcard and the answers. And uh, I, I may have told you, but I uh, they were talking about the non-traditional students, the the returning students, and that what I that's what I was for my master's degree. And I think I told you I was very scared. Uh, coming back thinking all these kids are coming right out of school they're used to studying they don't have three kids like i do they uh they, they don't have to worry about um you know all the things i have to worry about as a as an older person with with respons family responsibilities and so it, it, i i kind of freaked myself out a little bit and so i admit um my anxieties uh, were probably uncalled for but I actually use them to my benefit because my anxieties, what happens when when you are really anxious and somebody uh, 
to the point where you're scared? What happens in your body when you get scared? Adrenaline. If you get scared, you get an adrenaline flow. What does adrenaline do when adrenaline's flowing through your body? Can you sleep then? You're not feeling like you're sleeping. Uh, you, you, you suddenly uh, are wide awake. Uh, you're, it's, uh, it pushes some extra energy into your body. And so my being scared, uh, it, it provides me an adrenaline flow. And that's why I think that's one reason, and, and partly also my personality type, being kind of a perfectionist, that also I was scared more than the average student because I was scared not to be perfect. And so that added more adrenaline. So I, that uh, being concerned about being a returning student and just being afraid that I would not excel uh, add it add some adrenaline. I think that probably some of you have experienced that. Some who are a little bit more of a perfectionist personality, uh, one reason why they can study longer, in my case, I studied almost all night sometimes before a test that I thought was really going to be hard um, because I had adrenaline flowing. Uh, for those who are kind of laid back and, ah, I'll be fine, you know, uh, you're not going to get the adrenaline flow. <laughs> Uh, and so it's going to be harder for you to stay up all night because it just doesn't mean as much to you. Uh, you're just going to be, you're, you have a laid back personality and that's, uh, it ends up being an advantage to those who are a little bit perfectionist, who are scared not to be perfect. Uh, they get the adrenaline flow and some of you don't. Uh, so if you want to know the difference between those who are getting straight A's, that's one of the main differences. They put in the time, and part of it they can put in the time because of the adrenaline that they feel when they feel, oh no, here comes a test. What am I going to do? The adrenaline comes. Um, I, I, I think I may have told you, but I, the hardest test or the hardest uh, class in my master's degree was the research class. I think it's the hardest, probably the hardest one in our bachelor's program is we now have a bachelor thesis. I didn't have a bachelor's thesis, but I did face the master's thesis, and we had a very, I was told that the research class was the hardest class in the entire uh, sequence of courses for the master's degree, and the professor was the hardest, most demanding professor. And so, uh, basically, I went through the routine that I was just telling you, and I felt that adrenaline flow. I was up all night. I had my three, my cards uh, made out like, like, uh, uh, you know, to help me to memorize uh, my flashcards, so to speak. And uh, out of that uh, test, there were 171 points possible on that exam. Uh, I got 169 of the 171. And the next highest was 126. So I was like a third higher than anybody else in the class. The next highest, I really destroyed the curve, so to speak. But it was... Um, like I say, I had the adrenaline, I was up all night, I had the notes, I had the flashcards, um, and the professor said he didn't think he could have gotten that good a grade on his own, on, on his own test, own test. So I think I have it down pretty well on how to get a good grade on, on exams. Um, so this is my best advice. This is part of what's in that chapter. Um, I wanted to review it again. Um, it may end up on a test someplace. The, uh, these learning styles kind of relate a little bit. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, what's his name? Always forgetting his name. Um, Howard Gardner, yeah, uh, the the uh, creator of the multiple intelligences theory. Uh, notice that that these these do to a large degree correspond with the multiple intelligences. So some people are really good at uh, at verbal skills. Some some people are really good with their kinesthetic skills, and that is a type of uh, of intelligence. To have somebody, if you watched, if anybody's really into sports. Uh, some athletes can do things that are just startling. 
Um, I remember when Michael Jordan was in his heyday. Um, I remember one play in particular where it was right towards the end of the game, kind of do or die. Uh, everybody knew he was going to take the shot because he was the best basketball player in the world. Uh, they put the two tallest guys on him to try to keep him from shooting it. And he went into the air, and it looked, it just felt like he just hung there in midair. Um, I've tried to analyze that in my mind ever since. Is how does it seem like he's hanging there? And part of it was learning that the tall guys went up, and then they felt when, when the average person starts falling back down to the ground, they bring their hand down. So you jump high, you're falling down, you bring your hand down automatically. But Michael Jordan didn't do that. Michael Jordan does not react that way. So he was so the whole time while he's going up, and even when he's coming down, he's waiting to shoot to tell the, tell the tall guys to bring their hand down. And then he shot and made the basket and won the game. Uh, but it was what he did was able to do kinesthetically is the type of intelligence that even other star, other uh, great basketball players didn't re couldn't replicate. They were different than, uh, than Michael Jordan. And so it is a type of intelligence, even though it's not rewarded in the typical classroom. Um, but if you are kinesthetically um, oriented, it can help you. Um, I, I, there was a uh, way back in 1994, I became acquainted with uh, a uh, kindergarten through eighth grade curriculum, computer-based curriculum, and I, I was very impressed by how multisensory it was, and uh, it involved a lot of use of the mouse, which was again kinesthetic. And uh, I put my daughter on it, who was seen as a very mediocre student, and after three months, her teacher apologized to us that she didn't know that she was one of the smartest kids in the class. They'd just taken a nationalized test. And the truth is, she wasn't. Uh, but that that computer-based curriculum helped her plug holes that, that, for whatever reason, were in her conceptual framework. There were some holes that needed to be plugged. And in three months, it plugged them up very nice. And uh, so she became an excellent student. But a lot of that, that program used a lot of kinesthetic learning, a lot of movement, movement with your hands, with the mouse, and so forth, that made it that good. So you can kind of do that yourself to some degree too. It's somewhat that if you, uh, there are tricks sometimes to make things out of songs or chants, uh, things that you need to memorize, turn them into songs, turn them into chants. There's a number of ways that you can try to make your kinesthetic learning to implement that better. Uh, I know I'm a terrible auditory learner. I know that. Uh, there's a, uh, a language program called Pimsleur, and uh, I use that to try to learn Russian. And I, granted, I, w I was working at a university like this one that was all English based, and we weren't supposed to use the foreign language, the other language, Russian in that case. Um, so I didn't use Russian on in the in the you know in my in the university, and uh, I worked long hours to do research and so forth. And but still. As I would walk to school every day and walk back, I would listen to their auditory learning, and I, I did not learn very good Russian. I found out I, I need visual, I need kinesthetic. Auditory is not nearly enough for me. Remember this? Um, I kind of went through this a little bit fast. But again, this is kind of the learning process, um, and it could be compared to uh, what I was talking about. Uh, preparing is in part, um, you know, listening, writing your notes, you're preparing and all of that. You're absorbing uh, as you're reviewing. In my case, making flashcards um, was part of the review process and part of the capture process, trying to figure out what is the, the professor going to uh, test me on. Uh, also, when I went through textbooks, I would try to, uh, I would, I would not always read all the text, but I would try to, I would uh, skim it, and I would use a, a color pencil or whatever to mark the things I thought he might use, which ended up being, in many cases, the, uh, uh, the first sentence of a paragraph. 
I found if I knew the first sentence of most paragraphs that I, I could figure out the rest, I could remember the rest. And so I marked a lot of the first sentences. I really looked a lot at any graphics. Any, any graphics that existed in a textbook, I made note of that and looked at that very carefully because that's, again, psychologically, that's what, the professor, that's what the writer of the textbook thinks important. That's why he made a graphic out of it. And so graphics and textbooks are really important. Um, if you, uh, by the way, my, my stepson came here for his foundation and he's now at, an American, and now at an American University and that's the big shock for him is how much reading American students are supposed to do. Uh, so if you go to a foreign university um, outside of, you know, this part of, you know, they, they really emphasize a lot of reading. Um, so be prepared for that. Uh, reviewing, again, my flashcards end up being my review process as well. Okay, we're running out of time, so um, let me emphasize the important parts of this chapter. 